Good evening. Um, this is our midweek Bible study. Yep, oh, it blinked on off. Okay, try this again. Good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clegg. This is our midweek Bible study, and I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's. And we're going to get started with the announcements, but if you want to be turning in your Bibles, turn to Nahum. Uh, we're just working our way through the uh, Minor Prophets. I probably should call this series the Turn the Page series. So you just turn a couple pages and you're in another Minor Prophet. Um, they're not long. And uh, we are working over into Nahum now. And um, we're probably going to finish them tonight. We've got two chapters, but I think we'll finish. I think they'll go pretty quick. Um, so as you're turning there, um, let me just kind of go through the announcements. Um, and then we'll get into our prayer list. Um, like I say, we're doing our Sunday school starting at 9 a.m. And then um, at 10 a.m. we're doing our morning worship service. Um, we have both inside um, service. But if you're not feeling well or you don't feel comfortable coming inside, we still offer the option of uh, radio broadcast in our parking lot. So you can just come in, turn the radio to 87.9, and you can listen to the service and let us know you're out there by honking when you want to say amen and whatnot. But um, like I say, we're still offering that. And it was just funny right before I came up um, to get ready to start doing a broadcast. There was a thing on the news. And guess what they're talking about? A big outbreak of COVID, RSV, and the flu. Since everybody was traveling, the airports were crammed together. And all the families getting together and, and all different sorts. They're expecting numbers. Um, to rise um, so and I'm not surprised it happened last year um, so like I say if you're not feeling up to par just want to um, maybe just pull up and you know sit in your car maybe it's more comfortable for you um, some people that's you know an option we, we offer that so we have that out there if you do come inside just do practice good um, sanitary practice we're trying to limit um, the handshaking and hugging um, wearing a mask until um, you get your seat. Like I said, we're just trying to keep some basics in. Um, like I said, we're, we're, we're relaxing more and more as things get better, and that's good. Um, but like I say, if you got a cough or whatever, just be careful of each other. That's all we're asking. And that's the, that's true anytime, um, as we do have people um, in our congregation that are community compromised, and our visitors as well. Um, so like I say, we never know what we have. Um, the Christmas cards are due this Sunday, December 4th. Um, the Christmas card list was on the altar table. Um, there was one um, name omitted there if you didn't make the note. Um, remember Jennifer and Matthew Ward um, is there pulling together the list. So like I say, just um, remember them, um, add them. Keep them in the order um, that are in the list and rubber band them that way. Um, to help the people who are sorting them because if you can just imagine, you know Taking I don't know what we'll call it 30 decks of cards throwing them up in the air and trying to sort them all back out Yeah, you know, that's about what it's like. Um, we don't have a mail sorting machine at all. We got read people's writing and so like I say Just be careful Or excuse me. Just um, put them in order and they'll help everybody out. We appreciate the help um no birthdays this week, um, November 27th, which was a couple days ago. Um, happy 57th anniversary to Bobby and Marjorie Edge, and that's a great, a great accomplishment. So as our newlyweds um, celebrate their 57th anniversary, um, pray for them, bless them, um, give them a call, um, congratulate them on that. Um, if you're in the mood for a concert tomorrow night, um, actually November 30th, at 6.30 p.m. at First Baptist Church. They're having a Christmas concert and it's put on by the Second Time Around Band. So they'll be at the church at um, First Baptist at 6.30. So if you're interested in that, um, they're asking that you just come and attend and enjoy it. They're just putting this on for everybody to enjoy. Um, so like I say, that's available. Um, getting into our um, prayer list um, in the bulletin Marion Edwards Jada Clayton Karen Clegg um, David Warren Matthew Ward Mac McMorrow Shannon and Daryl Britt 
Chloe Akers, this is a praise. And sometimes, you know, you, you have a day at work and you come home and it's kind of, uh, been kind of tense maybe a little bit. And today's been one of those days. And Karen says, let me show you this video. And it was Chloe um, out in her side, out in her yard with her mother. And they're doing rehab exercises. And Chloe is in a little walker. Imagine a little two-year-old, you know, in a walker. And, of course, her mother has to help steady the walker because, remember, Chloe, um, because of her brain um, being gone, one whole side of her body is weaker. And so she's not able to steady the walker quite yet. She's getting there. They got a brace on her arm and all trying to help her. There. But her mother's just walking behind her, helping to steady it. And Chloe is walking with a walker with a smile and all. And her mother says she's just almost got it to where she's ready to take off. And it was just a beautiful sight. Um, a great pick me up, a great praise, you know, because we were praying for this baby even to make it with a number of seizures and then they had to go in and disconnect um, half of her brain and they're saying the whole right side wasn't going to work and, you know, she's making that right leg go and that right arm is trying to hold that walker down, you know, so she can steady it and it was just beautiful to see. So just keep praying for Chloe. She is making great Great roads. Um, God has just blessed her and blessed that family. So, like I say, I just wanted to share that because that was just a, a pick me up after having you know a little bit of a day today, and then coming home and seeing that video. It's just a great praise. Um, Janet House, Billy McKenzie, Linda and Kenny Elliott, the first family, Kyle Edwards, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Freddie McBroom, Lee Stevens. Hmm. Cynthia McMorrow and family, Ashley and Zaley Emmett, continue to pray for Zaley. We need those lungs. Um, they're coming up on four months, I think, and they're looking at possibly at trach. And I would, I would just you know, love to see this child's lungs just you know burst forth, and we know God can do it. So I'd like to say, um, remember Zaley, um, Paulette Fazen, B.J. Norris, Susan Warren continues to heal. Just continue praying for Tommy Everd, Rosemary Taylor. Louise and Ron Rising, Melody Oakley, um, Jennifer Milligan, Sheila Milligan, Hunter Kinlaw um, continues to make progress. Just keep praying for him. Michael Davis, Jim Miss Kelly, Ruby Johnson. Like I say, Ruby's home sore, so I'm sure she's going to bounce back. Um, like I say, not much keep, keeps Miss Ruby down. We all know that. Um, Cheryl Barker um, just continues. Um, as she goes through um, all her issues. Um, of course, member of the family of Pearl Jackson. Um, that funeral was Sunday. Um, just be with that prayers for that family and all. Um, the school systems, the pulpit committee, our church, the lost nation, its leaders, troops and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their families. Um, adding to that, um, Clark Godfrey had an appointment at Duke. Um, cancer Center, don't know the outcome of it, but they're hoping it would be a good appointment. Um, so we'll just keep praying for um, Clark. We saw him Sunday. Um, Betty Thrash. Um, Rachel arrived safely, so she good travels. Um, going back to school, so we're thankful for those prayers. Bobby Faye Harrell, healing up from surgeries. Um, Paula was under the weather. Um, remember Jarvis? And then um, Jessica was home from the hospital, and then Charles Coe. So several on our prayer list. Um, just continue to remember them. Um, and then, like I say, remember our, our families and our community. We have the food bank that we support. Um, there's definitely needs in the community. Um, a lot of us enjoyed a great Thanksgiving. Mm. Sinuses give me fits. Um let's just remember the families at this time of the year um and like i said be sensitive to people um, a lot of times um between thanksgiving and christmas is really a hard time for a lot of people um that have lost loved ones and had different issues in their lives so it can be a very trying period and on our soldiers that are overseas are separated from their families and won't make it back you know some of them for the holidays you know, it's tough on them, and it's tough on the families, and we just need to be sensitive to that. Um, sometimes we get all wrapped up in our stuff and all. But, as I said Sunday, 
it's never the wrong time to share the joy of Jesus. And, you know, people need to hear good news, and Jesus is the good news. So, you know, person having a hard time and all, pray with them, console them, you know, cry with them if you need to. I mean, the Bible tells us, you know, we're to cry, you know, grieve with those who are grieving, cry with those who are crying, laugh with those. I mean, you know, be empathetic, you know, and sensitive to their needs and all, and console them and help them, but tell them the good news. I am sure each and every one of us has have had times that Jesus has helped us get through a bad time or, or through a time of loneliness or death or something going on. Use it. These people need to hear it and they need to know that there's someone that cares and hopefully you're that person that cares, but also that Jesus cares and they need a savior to be with them when they, nobody else can. Don't miss those opportunities, but most of all, take the opportunity to minister. People need to hear good news. Turn the TV on. There's enough bad news. I know people need some good news. So, like I say, um, that finishes up our prayer request and and all our list. Um, I know there's personal and private concerns. Like I say, we got the war going on in Ukraine. We got battles all over this world. We got a lot of violence, and we're peacemakers, and we need to be praying for the violence to cease. Um, and all, and you know, one of the things I share with you is the church gets more active in the communities, not just our church, but all churches. As we increase our activity in communities and in people's lives, we can make a difference. A lot of times we forget that, you know, if people are, love Jesus and they come to know Jesus, then they're going to look at people differently. We look at people differently. That's why violence appalls us and hits us so much that concerns us is because we look at and we see the preciousness of life if that's a word and you know we need to use it and all and share the gospel and all and help people find Jesus because as people put value on life they're less likely to act violently so like I said there's many motivators out there to help us beyond what the Bible just simply commands us to be doing but also things to do to help others and help our communities and families and friends. All right, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, although, you know, bad things may happen in day, it don't make it a bad day because every day is a good day. You've given it to us. You've blessed us with it. And Father, like I say, I was having a little bit of a rough day and come home and saw that video of Chloe and it was just so great to see a praise. And, all, and, and I give you the praise for what you've done in Chloe's life and her family does too and everything, Lord. And it just picks us up when we see stuff like that. And that's why we got to share praises with each other and all because it helps each other. And Lord, we just thank you for those praises and thank you for just showing yourself and glorifying yourself in the things that we pray for. And Father, we lift up our prayer list. We lift up the needs. There's a lot of needs at this time, Lord. There's always needs in the world, but it's this time of year, it seems like we're more sensitive to them and a lot of things going around. And Father, we just pray that you'll just bless our loved ones, bless our families, our church families and friends and neighbors. And Father, we just pray that you pour out your blessings. And Father, we just pray for those who are battling cancer. We have a great number on our prayer list that are battling cancer and Father, we know that you can heal people from cancer. You can beat cancer. We've seen it and heard testimonies of it. And many within our congregation have been through it. And you've just demonstrated it. And we just pray time and time again. We pray, Lord, for the healing for these people. When the doctors say no or that whatever the doctors say, we're listening to you, Lord. And we're praying for you to glorify yourself in these lives, that they'll have a testimony and know that it was healing came from you. And Father, we have others who are recovering from different issues, different procedures and tests and surgeries. And Father, just bless them with a wonderful healing. Just heal their bodies, Lord, and strengthen them. They can return to do the things that they normally do, but most of all, to serve you, Lord, and bring you glory. And Father, we pray for others who have ongoing issues and battles that they're battling and their physical needs and things that afflict them. Lord, bless them. 
Bless them, Lord. Give them the strength for these battles, but also heal them, Lord, that they can overcome them and give you the glory. And Father, we pray for the private concerns. Father, there are a great many private concerns within our congregation and things that are being lifted up to you that only you know that they've requested that we support them in prayer and pray for them, Lord, but we also know that you know the actual prayer itself and the need. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them and hear those prayers. And Father, we pray. We pray for our school systems and our children. It seems like more and more we hear in the news about dangers and troubles and problems in the schools. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless our school systems and our children. Keep them safe, Lord. Let our schools be places of learning. Let be places of growing and maturing and be safe. Watch over them and those that teach and instruct and care for them during those times, Lord. And Father, we pray and give you the thanks for the travels. Father, we have many of us had loved ones that are on the road over this weekend and some of us traveled ourselves and over this holiday. And Father, we just thank you for the safe travels and pray that you'll continue to provide safe travels for us and our loved ones. And Father, we pray that our highways will be safe. And that many upon thousands upon thousands and millions that travel, may they all be safe. The Lord, as we hear reports of RSV and the flu and COVID all running together, and it's hard to differentiate one from the other, and the case is increasing in some areas, and expecting a spike. Father, we just pray your healing hand, Lord. We pray that this spike will not be like they're talking about in that. We will not see more children afflicted with RSV and COVID cases and flu. Father, we just pray these things will pass and subside. That we can move more and more closer back. Be able to be free to interact safely and, and all with each other. Our friends, our families, and our loved ones. Father, we just pray that you'll bless us. And give us this opportunity again. And Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've provided for us. And Father, we thank you for the blessings that you pour out upon us each and every day. And Father, we ask that you'll be with our military that's overseas. Lord, bless them and keep them safe. And Father, there's a great number of people in harm's way. Yes, there's wars around this world and rumors of war and flexing of sabers, or, so this, or rattling of sabers, as they say. Father, we just ask for all these things to be peaceful. There, everyone can be safe. Lord, bless them and keep them. And Father, we pray. We pray for our first responders, our police officers, our firefighters, ambulance drivers, and all those who rush in when others run away. And Father, we just pray for safe holidays for everybody and also for these individuals, Lord, for this is a taxing time upon them. Bless them and keep them safe, Lord. And Lord, we pray for our churches. Bless our churches. May they be active in their communities. May they make impacts in lives and draw people to Jesus so that we can see the benefits of it, Lord. That we see your power as you impact people's lives, how things change for the better. And Father, we just may we see this in our community and our friends and neighbors and families. And Father, as we study your word this evening, bless us in this study, Lord. Bless us that we may grow and learn from it. That we'll draw closer to you. For we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Alright. We're getting ready to stay. So hopefully you're at the second chapter of Nam. Changing weather. Changing sinuses, I guess I could say. So like I said, last time we started into this minor prophet of Nam, like I said, I think we're going to finish it this evening. It's a short book, and um, like I say, we got through the first chapter, and you know, Nahum deals with God's judgment upon the Assyrians, and particularly their capital city of Nineveh. This is the same Nineveh that Jonah visited and God spared, but that's years have passed um, since that happened, and they've become prideful and arrogant. They're a very powerful people. They're very strong. They're very vicious. Um, there's a lot of different things to describe, and we'll see some more of that as we go through this. Um, and we're going to see some of this. And 
like I say, the Assyrians were this great empire. Remember, right behind them comes along the Babylonians, who are even stronger. And like I say, you know, we Babylonians were so powerful, we kind of forgot how powerful the Assyrians were. And at the time the Babylonians are coming along, they're also allies with the Medes and Persians that will later, or the Medes, who later will join the Persians and later conquer the Babylonians. And all uh, it's just an ongoing cycle of the way God works. But in this, we're going to get, starting in chapter 2, we get this vivid description. And it's a little bit hard, and I'm thankful for commentaries that help us pull out what this is really saying. Because sometimes it's hard to pull out some of these images, especially out of the King James and some of the other translations and all. So we're going to see a description of the vision that God shows Nahum. Because Nahum records this vision, basically. And the fall of the Assyrians and how God uses the Medes and the Babylonians to judge this city. So let's get started. We're going to read the first four verses of chapter 2. He that dashes in pieces has come up from before thy face. Keep the munition. Watch the way. Make thy loins strong. Fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the em emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one another in the broad ways. And they shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. Now, again, some of this imagery is hard. And I'm thankful um, for the commentaries and all that help us understand it. Verse 1, what is it talking about? The opposing army is approaching. This would be the Medes and the Babylonians, right? The guards on the wall of the city see the army advancing. So these, we're talking basically about Nineveh. So the guards on the city, remember, Nineveh is a great city, three days. And um, it's a walled city. And so the, the guards are on the walls and are seeing this army approach. Now, so that's the first part of this. So they're sounding the alarm, and you can imagine the officers issuing the orders, and that's what it's talking about. Encourage your soldiers. Okay, get ready, you know, right? Um, you know, guard the fortress. You know, watch the road that comes up to it. You know, that come through the gates. Watch it. Make sure nothing goes through. And, you know, brace yourself. Marshal up your strength. It's time to fight. Get ready. You know, they're getting the men ready. And, you know, but above this... There's noise and all the voice of the Lord is heard. And he speaks to Israel and Judah. And he assures them that they will be restored and reunited. Remember, who's coming down? The Assyrians come in and they attack Israel, but they do not overtake Judah. They come up to the walls, but they do not overtake Judah. and all. But they wipe out 10 of the tribes, you know, that area. There's still Judah remaining. The Babylonians will take care of that. So he's assuring them, you know, they will be restored and they will be reunited. That's what it's talking about in verse 2. Now, this invading army is formal. It's got manpower, it's got armor, it's got weapons, and chariots. And chariots are like, you know, the tanks of the of the old Bible, of the Old Testament. You know, they're the weapon of the day. If you had tank, you know, the horses would be out on front, and a lot of the sh horses... They would even put armor over them so they couldn't even shoot the horses and kill them so, or hurt them. So the horse, horses are going through and they, some of them have these metal plates on their chest and some on their side. And imagine this horse running full steam into you with this metal plate on it. And it would just be like a tank running you, I mean, of that day, right? So here it is, you know, they have chariots. And that's what it talks about three and four. And it says their shields are red with blood. The chariots look like flames of fire as they dash here, there, and it's the streets of the city. So obviously, they breach into the city, right? And the soldiers find it easy to slaughter the defenseless people inside a walled city. The people are thinking, "Oh, we're safe. We got these great walls around us, and everything's good. We're okay." And then when they break through, there's like panic ensues. And the people flee in every direction. And it's just like, you know, a slaughter. That's really what it is. And all because the people are defenseless. They're not standing there in the streets waiting with weapons. No, they're thinking everything's going to be okay because they have these great walls. So now the chariots are in the city. They've reached the gates. 
And so verses 5 through 10. He, said, he shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk, and they shall make haste to the wall thereof. And the defense shall be prepared. The gates of the river shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. And Hazab shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up, and her maid shall lead her as with the voice of doves tabering upon their breast. But Nineveh is of old like a pool of water. Yet shall they flee. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and glory out of the pleasant furniture. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Now, again, thank you for commentaries and people who study this in the original Hebrew and everything and are able to give us the better image of this and are able to pull this together, right? He, in verse 5, refers to the king of Assyria who had plotted against the Lord and his people. We'll go back to verse chapter 1 and 9. Assyria was against Israel. God used them to punish Israel. You know, on many occasions and all to keep, you know, when the people sinned against God. So God would use the Assyrians as one of his punishments and to chastise them and bring them back in line. But sometimes these people would get carried a little bit too far. And that's part of what we'll see here. And it says what? The king gathers his best officers and gives them the order to protect the wall. But they are too late. Remember, we've already read the chariots are in the streets. You know, they stumble like drunks instead of marching like here. They're so, what's the word I'm looking for? Discombobulated, maybe. I don't know what's the word here. But, you know, they're... They, they're not the soldiers and the heroes and all staunching out. They're, they're staggering around with drunks. They're, they're totally out of order. And all. And the thing of it was, in their arrogance, again, Syrians were very strong and, all, and they were arrogant because of the strength, they thought their fortress was impregnable. But their defenses proved to be their undoing. Now, what happened? And this is interesting. I think this is great and I've seen some different historical shows about different things about cities like this. The Kosair River flowed through the city of Nineveh. So what did the people do? The Babylonians and all went up above the, the city and all and they dammed up the river. Okay. So they dammed up the river and then all of a sudden, what did they do? They released the water. And so when the water came rushing down, now it's a massive amount. They've dammed it up. They made this great dam. And now they released all this water. So rather than staying within its banks and flowing through the city, it's outside of its banks. And guess what it does? When it comes through, it tears out part of the wall and some of the buildings of the city. That's part of how they breached this thing, right? And so, what this is termed, and there's a term for this type of warfare, and it's actually been talked about even over in Ukraine and whatnot in the current modern warfare, so someone and all, it's nothing new. It's called hydraulic warfare. If you think about water in itself, we don't think much about it. But in force, in mass, it is a very powerful force. Think about it. We talk about hurricanes, we talk about strength, and we talk about the winds and all the storm and everything, right? But what does the major part of the damage? The storm surge with the waves of water. So here they use the wave the water to breach the city. You know, the chariots are in the streets and now they breach, they have just full reign of coming into the city of Nineveh. And all, so now it was just a simple matter they take control of everything. It didn't matter about the men on the wall. The part of the wall was gone. They were just flooding in there. And I'll literally with the water, right? But as much as the Babylonians and the Medes want to take credit for the battle, and I'm sure they did, they were pagan nations, 
it wasn't theirs. God took the battle. God decreed that the city would be destroyed, the inhabitants and killed or taken captive. Here, God was punishing his punishers. The Assyrians got a little bit too happy punishing, is, it, is what they allude to. And so God brings punishment upon them. They got carried away in a lot of things that they did. And we'll see some of this later on. So now what do they do? They line up the, the soldiers up and they start marching them off to their own lands. That was what the Babylonians would do. They'd take the people hostage and they'd take them back to their own land. And usually they would scatter them across their different areas. And there they will become slaves to the Babylonian Empire. Now, Nahum compares the exodus of to the exodus to water draining out of a pool. And all oh, what he's doing here. And then the soldiers begin the not the Assyrian soldiers, the Babylonian and Medes soldiers, they begin looting this fabulously wealthy city. Like I say, Syria was this great empire. And they had conquered a great many people and they had accumulated this great wealth. And here they are looting the city and the people are being marched out as prisoners of war and are going to be slaves and their hearts are just melt away. Hearts melt, knees give way, bodies tremble and every face grows pale. It's just, you know, they're just, wow, it's all gone. Think about what they're saying. Well, think about what they're thinking. You know, our great walled city, we're safe and it's gone. Now they're taking all the beautiful things that we had. And, and when reality shakes its ugly head, Nineveh is being treated the very way they treated everybody else. They're reaping what they sow. And it basically is scripture is what they're being told here. Their sins found them out. Now, after capturing the city and plundering its wealth and leading the people captured um, away as slaves, the victors then turn to the leaders they have captured. This is something they would do. You know, you make you get the people and all, but it's the leaders you want because if you take out of the way the leaders, it makes an impact. And so we get this imagery over in verses 11 through 13. Where's the dwelling of the lions? In the feeding place of young lions, where the lion, even the old lion, walked in the lion's whelp, and none made them afraid? The lion did tear in pieces enough for its whelps, and strangled for its lionesses, and filled its holes with prey, and his dens with ragging? Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth. And the voice of thy messenger shall no more be heard. Now, speaking on behalf of God, here the prophet has the last word. The Assyrian captives are marched away. The leaders and common citizens and the city's treasures are carried off by the captain. Nahum is taunting the Ninevites by contrasting their present plight with their former glory. A little bit of justice here, right? He's like, you guys are getting what you deserve. And... It's kind of rubbing it in a little bit, as they say. Now, what's so magnificent about the lion? One lion is, in a, a lot of cultures, considered a very noble beast. And we see it all the day. Even today, people associate with it. You know, it's not such a big emblem here in the U.S., but in other countries. But the lion is looked as ferocious. It's looked as, you know, we call it the king of the jungle. It's, you know, very strong, very stout. You know, and so it's very symbolic of leaderships and all. And so with that, um, like I say, they, excuse me, um, phone was going off and I didn't want to go off. Okay, I think I got it. So here, here's this line, right? And it's a magnus, it's a power um, we see it as a figurehead of majesty. All the way up into England, we saw it with symbols, with shields, and monarchies, and King John. And uh, you see all different things. And so lines are of this power figure. And with that, they am saying, what happened? You're, you're these great lines. You had all this. You know, what happened to your lion's den? And... 
you know, if you visit anything to do with the Assyrians, you're going to see the lion symbol everywhere. They they would paint it on their gates. They would emboss it on their gates in gold and everything. It was a very powerful symbol for them. And so if you see anything like you go to, library, to a library, a museum, you see different things about the Assyrians, you know, the, they acted like lions. Okay? That's really what they, they stalked their prey and they completely devoured their captives. They weren't very nice. And now they said, so where's your, where's your lion den? The city is destroyed. Where's your prey? The treasures you ruthlessly took from the other lion. Others, you know, they would take and get what they want. You know, what a lion does, he takes and he eats what he wants and he brings enough food back, not only for himself, but also for the cubs and everything for the other lions. And the Assyrians had amassed this great wealth beyond anything they needed. And they did it at the cost of human lives. And so... There's no wonder in verse 13, he says, I am against you. This is a position you don't want. You don't want God to say, I am against you. Not where you want to be. So over a century before, what happened? God had sent Jonah to warn Nineveh and the city repented. So, you know, hey, they're in a good spot. But now he's withdrew his hand and all. And he withdrew his hand to judgment now. But now, what? The time is up. You know, had they repented to the God and changed their ways and stopped being this vicious, evil people and all, things would have been okay. But they didn't. They went back to it. And in the end of it, Assyria would be left with no weapons, no leaders, no victories. Instead, their enemies would hear the voice of the carriers or the, or the people carrying the message announcing, peace is in the area because Assyria is gone. The big boys on the block, the bullies are gone. They've been defeated. That wraps up the vision. And we're going to get into chapter 3 here. Um, now, one of the things we have to remember is God is a just God. He's not a discerner of men and not a discerner of nations and all. He treats everybody the same. Um, in the sense that he shall not let certain things go on. You know, so... Genesis eighteen twenty five says, "What shall not the judge of all the earth do right?" Of course, God's going to do right. He is the judge of all the earth. And a lot of times we think, "Well, God's going to hold the judgment till the great white throne of judgment." There will be a judgment at the great white throne of judgment. But during the course of time, God also still judges and rebukes and chastens people along the way. God is long suffering. But when the time comes, it comes, and judgment will fall. In Psalms 9 and 5, it says this, You have rebuked the nations, you have destroyed the wicked, you have blotted out their name forever and ever. There are nations that once existed that no more exist. They crossed the line with God, and God destroyed them. Now, why? Why? Nahum gives us three reasons why Nineveh is deserved to be judged. Verses 1 through 3 deals with this, the ruthlessness and the bloodshed. It says, Woe to the bloody city. Now, there's an interesting name. Be called the bloody city. Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of the whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing of horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses, and there is none in of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. What's it saying here? I think some of this is pretty easy. The Assyrians were clever diplomats. They lied. Let me just put it, you know. They lied to other nations, and then they broke their promises and destroyed them. Make peace with us. We won't come in and do anything. As soon as you make peace and let your guard down, they come in and wipe you out. They slaughtered people without their regard to age or sex or anything. And they stacked up the corpses like lumber. They didn't just leave them late. They stacked them up and made displays of them. So that everybody would say, do not oppose us. 
or the same will come of you. The shedding of innocent blood is a serious sin with God. If you go back and you study Old Testament law, it's even today, it's shedding of innocent blood is wrong. And God takes note of it and remembers it. And at the point, he judges it. When depraved dictators who authorize the heartless slaying of innocent victims, they will someday answer to God. I think of the Holocaust. You can go back and look at the Assyrians. Imagine so many corpses stacked up, you trip over them. And all they would do that to the cities and the places they conquered. And, you know, we come forward and you, you think of Hitler. You know, who, all these people they killed and Stalin. Nobody knows how many people Stalin killed. It's estimated being the millions. All we know is that he purged it according to what he saw was right and wrong. He purged Russia, and really what it came down is anybody that stood against him, he got rid of. Even today, this is a practice among that culture. Their answer is just get rid of them. And there's other nations around the world that have the same type of answer. But they will answer to God. Reason number two, idolatry. Remember, Back at the time of Jonah, they repented and they turned to God. They repented of their sins and they turned to God and God spared them. Verses 4 through 7. Because the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredom and families through her witchcrafts, behold, I am against thee saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I'll show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame, and I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I see comforters for thee? Now, we've talked about this before. Often in Scripture, especially those who have made the covenant with God, and that's why Israel was in this situation, any times they go after idol idols and worship other gods, God talks to them as if to a whore or an unfaithful wife, as one who's in adultery. So idolatry is associated with prostitution. Um, you consider... Um, and, and the reason in this particular case why it's associated with prostitutes the chief deity of Nineveh is Ishtar goddess of sexual passion, fertility and war and you can understand why Nahum used this metaphor, that's why he's using this imagery, right? Because this is the god they worship and so because of their spiritual blindness, the Syrians were ensnared by this evil goddess and we're under control of lust, greed, and violence. And Psalms 115.8 reminds us that people become like the God they worship. If you worship an evil God, you will take on the characteristics of that. If you worship a God who has no regard to life, then you have no regard to life. But if you worship a God, such as Jehovah, who considers all life precious, you have a great value to it. That's why violence and these things and abortion and all this are, are, are so offensive to us because we are like our God and it is offensive to him. So become like the God you worship. So if you find yourself worshiping or saying that certain things are okay and it doesn't bother you, but it goes against the scripture, you better be looking at what God you're worshiping. Because if it goes against scripture, or against God's word, or you're stretching the truth out of it, or turn, twisting the word in order to get your view, then you're not worshiping the God Jehovah. So I warn you, that is a test that you can always know where you worship God or not. So the Assyrians spread this evil influence to other nations and enslaved them by sorcery. They believed in witchcraft and sorcery. And I was just reading through, I'm in the Old Testament as I started going through my Bible again. And on one of the things to talk about, 
it has just a verse in there that says, no, if, you know, which shall be stoned? Someone that practices witchcraft and sorcery, stone them. That's it. Do not tolerate it. <clears throat> and here you have a nation that practices it and is just obsessed with it. Now, part of the things, going back to where it talks about calling them prostitution and everything. In ancient times, prostitutes were often shamed by being publicly exposed. And that's what God is promising to Nineveh. I'm going to expose you to everybody. He's going to show them to all the nations. And this will end their evil influence. This magnificent, wealthy city and all that is just known throughout it is so powerful and everything. And now it's nothing. It's a heap of ruins. The wall has been washed down and the invaders came in. They've destroyed and looted and taken. The third reason for a serious fall is their pride and their self-confidence. Verses 8 through 11. Art thou better than populous? No. That was situate among the rivers and that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was a sea and her wall was from the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength and it was infinite. Put and Lubin were thy helpers. Yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed to pieces on the top of the streets and they cast lots for her honorable men and her great men were bound in chains. Thou shalt also shalt be drunken. Thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. Now, in this closing scripture, and we're going to go on to the end with this here in a minute, Nehemiah just sort of sums up this condition of Assyria. And he's given us a large number of image, imageries, images and all to show a series of weaknesses and assure them that that is the ultimate defeat they're done. Now remember, oh, this is a vision. This hadn't happened yet. He's telling what's going to happen in the future. And he begins with the fact of history, the defeat of the Egyptian city of Thebes or Noaman by the Assyrians, that's what they called it, in 663 BC. If you visit Karnak in Luxor and Upper Egypt, you will be at the site of ancient Thebes. And this capital city of, the, of Upper Egypt was sure it was safe from the invader, yet it went down to defeat. Who would defeat them? The Assyrians. They thought they were safe. They were undefeatable. And guess who walked in and took him? Assyria. Just like Nineveh, Thebes was situated by waters and was supposed to be their defense, but the city fell just the same. The Thebes had many allies, but they could not protect them from the Assyrians. What Assyria did to the city of Thebes in Egypt was done to them. It was turned around. Their children would be dashed to pieces. Their leaders would be slaves, and the people would become exiles. Now argues, man, if this happened to thieves, that's what his argument is. If this happened to thieves, why couldn't it happen to Nineveh? See, some people, when the prophets prophesy, they argue with, ah, that couldn't happen. So in this prophecy is God's leading name. He says, this is history repeating itself. Thebes thought they had it okay too. But the Assyrians wiped them out. Now it's going to happen to the Assyrians. The pride, the self-confidence is going to bring their downfall. And it would be the Medes and the Babylonians this time that would come to Nineveh. And Nineveh would drink the cup of God's wrath, as, as one commentator puts it. They're going to reap what they sowed. Now, in fact, we get a little bit of imagery or illustration or commentary from um, Nahum telling us how easy this would be. It would be like ripe figs dropping into a person's mouth. Verse 12 says, All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall fall, even fall into the mouths of the eater. So it's going to be so easy for them to come in. It's just like taking this young fig tree and shake shaking it right and the figs will just fall off into the mouth of the eater no problem 
Why? Because the Assyrian soldiers are going to be drained of their strength. And they're going to be like a woman, weak and afraid and unable to meet the enemy. In verses 13 40, Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of the land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour, devour thy bars. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy hold. Strongholds, go into the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the bricken. What it is saying is they won't be able to bar the gates to stop the enemy from setting fire to them. Nor would they be able to repair the walls or carry water to put out the flames. They are going to be weak in state. And then verses 15 through 17, it gives us the image of these insects, right? It says, there shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. That make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locust. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and fleeth away. Thy crowned are the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which are camped in the hedge in the cold day. But when the sun arises, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. The invading soldiers is saying is the invading soldiers are going to sweep through the land and see like a plague of grasshoppers and locusts and wipe everything out. We've seen this before, even in the plagues of Egypt. You, you, they devour everything. They just come and they just wipe it out. And the Babylonian merchants were also like, they collected all the treasure they could find. There's something for you, right? They didn't keep the treasure. They traded it and got more wealth from it. That's part of what you know, the merchants are going to do. They're going to take what they bring back as spoils and they're going to trade for it and trade it and make more money. And all just this great bounty. But the Assyrian leaders were like the locusts that go to sleep on a wall on a cold day. But when the sun comes up, they feel the heat and fly away. The king and his council were overconfident. Like locusts sleeping on a wall, but when the invasion occurred, they flew off to a safe place. Not so for them, right? The Assyrians were captured. Verses 18 19. This will finish up the book. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Syria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people was scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap their hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? Assyria was like a scattered flock with sleeping shepherds. And we often see this in scripture. It talks about sheep and shepherds and how the sheep know their voice. But what would happen is that if the shepherds weren't attentive, the sheep would wander. Hmm. And then let something else come in and spook them and whatever. They would scatter. They wouldn't stay together in this you know, grouping. They would scatter because they'd been spooked. And all. And what would happen is if the shepherds weren't attentive, the flocks would be scattered. Now you think about it. You have several shepherds and all, and they would bring their flocks together at night. And what they were supposed to do is take turns watching so that nothing scattered the flock. But if somebody fell asleep on their watch and something happened, the flocks could be scattered. And all. So that's the first part. It says, or like a wounded body with no way to be healed. Sometimes, if you've ever seen this and all, or some of you probably experience it, even somebody with diabetes is common to them. They have a wound on their body, it won't be healed. And that's not that they're saying the Assyrians had to that means what it's saying is your wounds won't be won't heal at all. That's what it's like. That's what's happening to them. The wound is grievous, and then it says they had no allies to rescue them. For all their nations would rejoice. Think about, it. oh, we're with you. We're with you, Assyria. As long as they're great and strong, but boy, let them fall. And everybody's like, "Woo, glad they ain't making it no more. We ain't going to help them out. If they fall, that makes our life easier." And they never weren't thinking about the Babylonians coming along, but anyways, you know, their 
allies abandon them or the, and they and maybe they were smart enough to see the Babylonian army and say you know what that's a bigger bigger mountain than we want to climb and maybe they said hey we ain't gonna come help them there's all kinds of different things about it but it's the same thing they heard it and they rejoiced the Assyrian Empire is no more they'd rather deal with the next one than what they were dealing with right then so like the book of Jonah the book of Nahum ends with a question for us for who has not felt your endless cruelty that's what it's talking about in verse 19. That's translation out of verse 19. And all. For us in the King James, it says, For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? What he's emphasizing is the same truth that was declared by the prophets Amos. God punishes the cruel nations that follow inhumane policies and brutal practices. God's going to punish these nations. And, you know. <sighs> I can't give you a modern example in a sense, but I think about World War II and you think about some of the countries that were involved in it and the things that have happened. Many of them have rebuilt back up to today, but you think of the state of Germany after World War II, the state of Italy, Japan, you know, at the end of the war, they're in great and dire straits. I mean, you know, think about the bombing of Berlin and the pictures we've seen. And Italy sided with, you know, Germany and everything. And, you know, the Allies marched across Italy. And then you had the whole thing of, you know, the bombing of Japan and Hiroshima. You know, they were not in a good position then. And that, you know, you can look upon that as God punishing them for what they've done to bring the world into a world war. Whether a nation is practicing genocide, exploiting the poor, supporting slavery, or failing to provide people with the necessity of life, the sins of national leaders are known by God. And he eventually, the leadership of a country, there is a responsibility there to make sure everybody is taken care of. Being the leader of a country does not mean take care of yourself. It means you are to lead and take care of your nation. And God will hold leaders responsible too. If you, you know, question what really happens or whatever, go look at Nineveh. Search for Nineveh. You won't find much. God destroyed it. And he wiped it off the face of the earth in a sense. I won't say completely, but he did a number on it. So that everybody would see the power of God and know that when God brings judgment, it's real. And a lot of people say, well, you know, there was a war and it was a battle and that's all. And they, they don't look. Well. There was bigger cards being played behind the scenes than what was obvious to the people at the time. God was bringing judgment and God was bringing wrath. So with that, that concludes an AM. We have finished another Miner's Prophet. It was a very short three chapter book. And like I say, hopefully you got something from it. But I think a lot of it we have to look at and reflect and learn. One, how is our nation behaving? And how is our leadership? And that's part of the reason. The other thing is about the people. If the leadership had gone astray, the people could have stuck with God. And probably been all right, but instead, what they do, they followed the leadership, and they themselves became vicious and everything. And, and so, I think I love the the point of that, you know, thing it made right there. Was said what? Whatever God you worship, you take on the characteristics. Well, if we would take on the characteristics of God, we would be a just and righteous people. We'd be a long, long suffering and caring and wanting well for everybody, and we would be wanting to share the gospel and do the things that we're supposed to do. But a lot of us don't look that way. So you have to ask what God is a lot of people in some of the churches worshiping when they don't behave like God. Interesting question. And I'll leave you with that one. And all, but it will also be a good self-test for you. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. And Father, we thank you for the minor prophets and, and all and for Nahum. And we see how you deal with a nation that, you know, sin and worship 
idols and everything. And Father, but also we can look at it on a personal level. That if we stray from you and we worship idols and we're very, you know, harmful towards other and everything, hurting the people, that you'll bring judgment upon us too, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you'll just bless those who have heard this service. And Father, bless them that, you know, their families. And Father, we pray that you just bless the church. May it reach beyond its boundaries and impact the communities for you, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless us and guide us in all things. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless and have a good night.